Um, welcome everyone to our monthly support group. Uh, my name is Janet Rodriguez and I'm the program coordinator at the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank our wonderful sponsor, uh, the Riverside Medical Clinic, for all their support. Thank you so much. Um, and then again, uh, during the presentation, we will be taking questions, so feel free to add those questions into the chat box. Um, I will make sure that those are being answered. And then um, along with that, if you don't want to, or if you do, uh, feel free to add your questions in the Q&A as well. Um, that option is there for you. Um, if you are coming a little bit late and missed something, or maybe you have someone that's coming in to, to join us today, um, no worries, we'll, we will be um, recording this and adding it onto our YouTube channel. So even if you're in here and you wanna rewatch this great information and great webinar, um, that'll be uh, ready for you by the end of the week. Um, okay, we will have our Q&A at the very end. Um, but throughout, like I said, the presentation, please feel free to add those questions into the box. Um, I want to make sure that everyone has their questions answered before we leave today. Um, and so with that being said, I would like to uh, introduce my speaker of the day. So Kimiko Kelly is the Community Education Manager at the Alzheimer's of Los Angeles, where she works to increase awareness about dementia. She has more than 18 years of experience working to provide culturally and linguistically uh, sensitive outreach in diverse communities. Uh, Ms. Kelly earned her master's in public policy from the University of California, Los Angeles. And so with that being said, I'd like to give the floor to Kelly. Great, thank you, Jeanette. Um, well, welcome everyone. We're very excited to partner um, with the Riverside Foundation to provide education about Alzheimer's and dementia and provide skills building and information and resources to families out there experiencing Alzheimer's or dementia. So um, just to talk a little bit about our organization, Alzheimer's Los Angeles, we are a nonprofit agency that provides free services for families experiencing Alzheimer's or dementia. We also have about 40 staff on hand. We work in LA County, San Bernardino County, Riverside County. And now that we're virtual, pretty much anybody can access our services. And um, among our staff, we have the education and outreach department, which is the program I work in. And then we also have a whole staff of um, service providers, social workers who do answer the helpline, provide care management and care planning. So if anybody needs additional help or services, um, we'll provide that helpline number at the end and um, we'll also email it to you. Um, but we also have support groups and a variety of other services. We do professional training. We do policy advocacy. We work in state and national um, elected officials to work on policies to improve the health and well-being of our families. So that said, today's topic is holiday tips for caregivers. We know the holidays are coming up and it can be a very nervous and stressful time thinking about um, gatherings, especially with someone we're caring for that has Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. So we'll go over some um, discussions about what to think about in preparing for the holidays. Oh, I wanted to start off. First, we do want to acknowledge that we are under special conditions right now with COVID-19. Um, we're at stay-at-home orders. As you can see, we're working remotely, um, but all our staff are fully uh, working right now. Um, we do have our helpline, as I mentioned, 844-HELP-ALZ. Um, um, we can call with any question, um, big or small. There's no obligation, no requirements. We serve everybody. You can also email us with any questions or um, um, any need for resources. And then you can visit our website, which has a whole lot of information about our classes, our support groups, and all of our care counseling and educational talks. So um, you're welcome to contact us at any time. So why do we get stressed during the holidays? You know, it can be stressful overall in general, but when we're caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia, there's definitely a huge added stress. So what do you think will happen with the person with Alzheimer's? So there's concerns about will they get frustrated? Will they um, behave inappropriately? Um, how do we manage that? You know, how are we going to get through the holidays um, and try to enjoy it, given that we have um, a special condition we're working with. So we'll talk about tips on how to prepare and manage that journey and hopefully enjoy it uh, a little better that, that we're prepared. 
um, what do you think will happen with the other family members? So that's another huge concern. Um, either they may not be aware of um, um, some of the behavior or um, cognitive issues. Um, they may not believe it. They may be in denial or they may not want to be in the presence um, because of their own inability or, or, or fears or um, you know, just uncomfortableness with us being around somebody with uh, cognitive issues. So, so just thinking about these things, um, thinking ahead of time, processing these kind of concerns that we have, it's a good time now to think about it so that we're kind of um, really kind of understanding what's going on and what our nervousness is about. What do you think will happen to our holiday traditions? So, um, and without COVID, Already, things are going to be modified when you have somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. We may have great big family parties, um, dinners, um, evening events, you know, kids events, um, all kinds of things that we may be doing um, that may have to be modified now because we're caring for somebody. We have a family member that has Alzheimer's or dementia. And so that may have caused some stress, some concerns, some worry and saying, you know, um, there's kind of maybe a pressure to do too much when it, that might not be appropriate. So we want to sit down now, think about it. Um, again, on top of this is the layer of COVID-19. We are really going to, all of us are modifying our holiday traditions um, and trying to do things a little bit differently, but still celebrate and still enjoy and still embrace these wonderful times that we have every year. You know, these, this time that we look forward to. You know, we just had Halloween and we definitely all had to modify that. Um, there was no door to door trick or treating. And and while it's very hard and sad to not um, enjoy that pleasure, people modified things in different ways. Um, they did more pumpkin carving or things you can do at home more small parties. So we'll talk about things we can do both in general with somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. And then now adding the, um, the additional layer of COVID-19 and having to be social distance be safe. Okay, we are going to go over 10 holiday survival tips. And again, as Jeanette mentioned, you will be able to either see this um, as a recording later, um, and we also will provide it as a handout. So you can you don't need to write anything down or record it or take pictures of the screens because we will provide the slides to you in a handout. So tip number one, the first thing to start off with is to understand the emotions. It's very, there's a lot of emotions that go on with somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, you know, the parent that we had, the spouse that we had, the brother, the sister, the aunt, the uncle, um, the neighbor, the cousins, the best friend, um, they're not the way they used to be. So there's a great sense of loss. There's a certain sadness for losing um, seeing that person lose their cognitive abilities, not be able to remember things, not be able to do the things that they used to do. Um, so definitely, you know, understand that that's a certain sense of loss that's going to be occurring. And, you know, in family gatherings, it may become more visible. Um, they may not have wanted to uh, admit it earlier, but when you get together, you know, there may be moments where you really recognize something is, is gone and, um, and just be aware that those are um, valid emotions. Guilt for not doing enough. So this is a lot having to do both with caregivers and other family members that may be coming in may say, oh man, I feel so bad. I, I wasn't helping. I'm not able to help, you know. So understand that that makes people uncomfortable too. We all feel bad when we feel guilty and um, we'll try to, you know, just understand that. There's feelings of discomfort, you know. Um, you know, the typical scene is little kids not knowing why grandma doesn't know who they are or doesn't know their name, you know. So um, being prepared for that, um, thinking of ways that we can address that in a way that's comfortable and comforting for both sides. Denial, not wanting to accept the changes. So definitely we hear that in a lot of our families. There's always members, not always, but often members who just say, there's nothing wrong. I don't know why, you know, you say this uh, grandma has dementia. She seems perfectly fine, you know? So um, there's going to be that and, and just understand that's also natural, you know, that we don't want to battle with that and convince anybody. Everybody's going to take their time and acceptance. Um, and we are going to have to give people time to get to that point. And then on top of that, fear and anxiety due to COVID-19. So lots of tension right now. 
Um, there's fear of the disease, of the flu, this flu virus, that's very, very dangerous. Uh, and so everybody has been, you know, under this kind of quarantine and lockdown and just social distancing. So there's just a lot of tension in general. So being prepared, understanding all of these things are going on at the same time. So things you can do to prepare the person with dementia for holidays and holiday gatherings. Um, some things, tips are show photos of who will be visiting. You know, there may be people they haven't seen in, um, in months or years. And, um, you know, just talk about who they are, trying to see where they're at as far as remembering and um, understanding, you know, what the capacity is there. Visit the doctor, make sure any health issues are addressed now to get a checkup. There may be things going on that you may not know about, you know, so we don't want to have a health um, crisis during the holidays. We try to avoid that. So see if there's, you know, lots of things that could be going on. So just try to see if there's any issues that might be addressed ahead of time. Um, familiarize the family member with others who may provide care during this time. So you may be the primary caregiver and mostly providing the care 24 seven. Um, but if you're gonna need some help during the holidays, if, if at family gatherings, there may be somebody else who might help you out in caregiving, um, try to have that person introduced ahead of time, whether it's professional caregiver or another family member or somebody else. Um, practice using protective steps, such as wearing ma face masks, using hand sanitizer. Um, maybe you have been isolating at home and um, not going out so you haven't been using face mask a lot but that may be a little strange for somebody with alzheimer's or dementia so practice wearing a mask um, practice um, using those safety steps um, whenever touching anything um, using hand sanitizer washing hands so that it's it's kind of more normalized before the holidays because when you have other people come into the um presence they are going to be needing to wear masks so maybe a little bit scary for folks um, number three, prepare the caregiver, prepare yourself, exercise, eat well, take care of yourself. Of course, in general, want to do that. But, you know, during these stressful times, try to do all these things throughout the holidays. You know, make sure there's time that you take to take care of yourself. Because if you're um, tense and nervous and stressed, it's just going to accelerate that. And the person with Alzheimer's or dementia also can feel that. Um, delegate duties, identify your support network, you know, try to find tasks that other people can do. Um, the holidays are a busy time. We like to do a lot. We like to shop for gifts. We like to make um, nice meals. We like to decorate. So if you can get some help, maybe not caring for the person with Alzheimer's, but other things that um, other people can help with, try to identify it now. Plan breaks and time to you for yourself. Um, you know, make sure that you're not, you know, you're already working 24 seven and you're not doing even more during this time. Make sure you have time to take a break, um, you know, even if it's small increments, 15 minutes at a time throughout the day so that you can get your little rest and reset and, re and, and you know, keeping your calm. Plan time for you to spend time with other family members. I know we're focused on the person with Alzheimer's or dementia, and we want to make sure they have um, that special time together. But also you deserve a special time to visit with your mom or visit with your brother or visit with your cousin. So see if you can structure it in there. Think of ahead of time. Again, sometimes it doesn't happen unless we schedule it in. So see what, what, is it, what does it take for you to structure that in when you can take 30 minutes to go to lunch with your brother who you haven't seen, you know, because that's precious time for you as well. You are just as important. Identify your boundaries, what you can and can't do. Now, people who aren't around the person with dementia 24 seven don't know their limitations and they may want to do things like, hey, let's go out to eat, let's go to Denny's, you know, they have an outdoor patio and you know, right instinctually that that's just not a good thing to do that your person with dementia is not going to be able to handle it very well um so try to be careful that people even with their best intentions are not convincing you to do things that are not comfortable and not appropriate so um identify your boundaries you know what things that you feel like you can and can't do and try to stick to them as much as possible and this goes along with trust your instincts if you know in your gut that that's not a good idea it's probably not going to end up well anyway and, and try to let people know. 
And number four, prepare other family members. So this is really, really great. You know, educate family members about what limitations there are. Let them understand whether it's mobility or cognitive issues or just, you know, being overwhelmed. You know, really lay it out for people to let them know this is what the limits are. Share communication techniques. You know, communication is different when someone has dementia. So whether it's um, talking slower, um, not asking too many questions, or um, maybe it's a little bit of touch, you know, on the shoulder or being in front of them when talking, um, you know, what things work best. Um, share about difficult behaviors and how to respond. So maybe um, one thing I heard is uh, a woman taking care of her husband. He's very obsessed with the election. So he's always asking, did we vote? Are you sure we voted? So, you know, kind of repetitive questions like that. If they're um, obsessed, obsessed about a certain thing, whether it's their finances or maybe they accuse people of stealing things, you know, someone stole my wallet. Just let people know that that's going to happen. And, and the main goal is to keep calm and just be reassuring uh, through the whole thing. Um, identify safety measures required during COVID-19. Make sure everybody's aware they need to wear a mask around the person. Most likely, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia occurs in the later years, so um, they're higher risk populations. Um, no contact methods of socializing, using hand sanitizer. Um, really, really stressing that this is all for the safety of the person with Alzheimer's or dementia. As much as we want to hug them and we want to be in their presence, um, we want to make sure um, that they're safe from contracting this virus. And you may have to limit anyone who is potentially risky. So someone who's been exposed a lot, someone who's been going out, um, you know, you want to identify who are the high risk people and maybe limit those that exposure. So adapting holiday traditions. Um, we would do this um, in general, um, changing the time of family gatherings to a time that is the best time for the person that we're, we're gathering with, for the person we're caring for. Um, maybe we used to have evening dinners late into the night at eight o'clock, and maybe by that time it's their bedtime. So maybe we can move the time earlier to a lunchtime dinner. You know, and um, now we're saying like, if we are going to have family gatherings during this time of COVID, um, ideally, it would be virtual. Um, you want to try to keep that distance. Um, it's not ideal, actually, but it's during this time to stay safe. But if you are going to get together, um, you could try getting together outside, social distanced, uh, making sure there's set space between chairs, and um, then you would hold it earlier to have a warmer time of day. Um, find a location um, that's good for the person. And um, set the time length, you know, um, depending on what stage they're in. If they're in early stage, they may be able to go an hour or two. Um, but in the middle stages, it may be less and less time that they're able to do a, a big gathering or social events like that. So even if it's virtual, you want to set a time that it's the best time of the day and the, time, the length of time that works for their attention and ability to be engaged. Um, plan activities that fit with abilities. Again, um, uh, you know, you're not going to have um, have somebody in the middle stages doing a lot of the cooking. Uh, maybe mom has Alzheimer's or dementia and you love to have her cook, but maybe she can only do certain parts of it. So make sure that we're aware of the abilities and there's not this ex expectation of them to do things beyond their abilities. Again, even, you know, if you do plan to go to a restaurant that has outdoor seating, um, making sure that that fits where they're at, if that's within their abilities and structured in a way that, that fits their um, attention span. Prioritize activities and identify those that cannot be done. So there may be lots of things you do and say, okay, these are things that we cannot do. Um, you know, um, whether it's certain family members or, or um, activities, games you used to play, you know, just identify what works. And again, try to explore virtual options. Um, one recommendation is if you are going to do a virtual event, you know, try to have a big screen. Sometimes you can connect it to your TV to have even a bigger screen. Um, and, and if you're, if that's not an option, the virtual thing, try alternative things. Um, you can write letters or cards, gather photos and make a photo album and send that along and talk on the phone and go through the photo album together. You know, think of creative ways to, to still celebrate together. 
So gift suggestions, you know, people love to give gifts and they want to give gifts. So um, provide some suggestions of what works. You know, you don't want a, uh, a bunch of gifts that are that are not useful and not appropriate. Um, you know, a lot of electronics or, you know, brain games or things that are breakable that they can't use. So think of things that are useful that people can give. So usually a lot of things that are always good are comfortable clothing, um, wraps and blankets are always welcome, ponchos, socks, slippers, sweaters, you know, anything like that that would be comforting and useful for the person. You could try audio tapes of books, or maybe they have a favorite music. Music has been shown to be a great way of um, engaging somebody with dementia. So what are their favorite music that you could share? Um, photo albums, picture books, you know, are there things that they love to look at, whether it's um, cute baby animals or maybe it's nature scenes, um, you know, travel pictures, sports, you know, try to connect to their hobbies and interests. Maybe it's cars. You know, what are the things that they love and uh, maybe find picture books or create photo albums that that they can um, enjoy. Um, gift certificates to um, maybe food delivery services would be great. You might really appreciate that as a caregiver to foods that they really like. Um, donations in their name um, to various things and letting them know and giving them a nice card showing what, where their money is going to. And um, give advice for things that are not useful. So, so we don't want candle holders or we don't want candles anyway. So, you know, think of things that work and give the suggestions um, so that people are able to engage. Um, preparing the home. So if you are um, having a holiday gathering or event at your home, you know, how or at somebody else's home, here are tips for preparing the space for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, make sure there is a calm area or a calm room if there needs to be a break. Um, we know as the, 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 the disease progresses, um, there are times when people can get overwhelmed. You know, there's just too much noise going on. There's too much activity, lots of kids running around, they're playing games, they're making noise. And for a combination of reasons, their brain is not able to process all that. And it could lead to, you know, a lot of frustration and confusion. So. Plan for a calm area, calm room where you can go, have some quiet space um, and not be overwhelmed with all the activity. Avoid confusing things like artificial decorations of food, or artificial grapes, anything that looks pretty or edible on the table. Um, you wanna make sure that they're not accidentally reaching for it. Um, again, it could be candles that are shaped like grapes. So really be aware of things that may be confusing. Um, run through safety issues, you know, fall issues, and this is good for any seniors. Um, um, we really want to prevent any falls. It's very hard to recover, so make sure there are no rugs that are slippery. Um, there's no clutter around on the ground to trip on. You know, on our house, we take our shoes off, so there's lots of shoes at the door. Make sure there's a good place to put those out of the way so they're not tripping over them. And good lighting. Um, hallways, rooms, make sure there's um, good lighting so that you can see your way very well and light switches in a convenient place. Um, and keep an area that is kept monitored for COVID-19 safety measures. So if you are um, having people in your home for the first time, uh, people are visiting, um, make sure that it's well monitored. Maybe there's a separate room that the person with dementia is in um, that is not entered without uh, first, washing your hands, wearing masks, and keeping distance. Um, everything in there is um, um, using um, disinfectant. So we want to take every measure possible to make sure our person is safe. And I'm sure everybody wants to do that as well. So making sure that um, those protocols are followed. And then stock up now on your mask, your hand sanitizer, your tissue, your disinfectant, all the things needed to... Um, uh, to keep us safe from um, contracting the virus. Okay, number eight, we are planning activities. So even though someone has Alzheimer's or dementia, it doesn't mean that they're gonna sit in the corner and not be involved or not be engaged. Um, so really think of things that they can do, schedule family and friends visit times. You maybe don't want to have everybody at once. You want to have, even in a virtual um, 
format. You don't want to have the whole screen with everybody. Maybe you want one or two at a time, you know, and plan for those nice conversations and also um, help by thinking about um, topics of conversations. You know, we know with um, Alzheimer's or dementia, it's usually the short term memory that goes first, but the long term memories are there. So this is the time to really cherish those and really enjoy and talk about the past and talk about their memories and, you know, get those stories of when they grew up and, and the other family members. So schedule time to visit and also um, topics of dis discussion that work. Um, schedule naps, quiet time. Again, you don't want to overwhelm the person with a bunch of Zoom calls, right? So you want to have breaks, long breaks. You want to have, you know, one at a time um, and you want to have quiet time too. So really thinking about what works with where they're at right now and not, try not to overdo it. Uh, you definitely don't want to overwhelm them. You don't want them to feel pressure um, and get frustrated that way. So identify activities that they can do. So people may be, um, there's gonna be less traveling uh, this year, but there's still maybe people visiting. They may be local, maybe coming over that don't often come over and think of things that you can do. Um, taking walks is great. If they're mobile and they're able to go, take the dog for a walk or just go for a walk. We are lucky here in Southern California. We have lots of beautiful um, places to go, whether it's the beach or the mountains or, or um, just in our neighborhoods. It's, and we have lovely weather throughout the uh, winter months. So a walk is always an option and it doesn't even have to be far or doesn't have to be long. You know, it's even just getting outside. There are other things that many people do um, and, and outside and just getting outside. One thing is um, you could have a bird feeder, feeder, looking at birds or looking at plants. You know, we do have lovely weather here and lovely vegetation. So if they like looking at flowers or different plants, you know, make that an activity. Um, you could have uh, the you could have a little um, uh, uh, bird bath station too. Uh, other things can thinking of things that you can do to be engaging and um, you know outside if possible. Uh, you can do things like cooking, making cookies together, um, thinking about where they're at and what part of that process they can do, whether it's just mixing or you hand them the cup of water, they pour it in, you know, so doing things together, but in a monitored way and that in, in a way that's careful. Um, looking at photo albums is always great. Um, one person said he has photos on his phone. So when he visits his dad, it's an assisted living, living. So when he goes to visit his dad, he always pulls up a few pictures on his phone. And, you know, it's always comforting. People they're familiar with and stories they can, they can tell. So photo albums are great. Or, you know, other things that they love, you know, whether it's sports, um, pets, or gardening. Um, pictures, picture books, things to look at that they love and love to talk about. Listening to music is another great way to reach somebody who has cognitive issues. Um, music has shown to really engage somebody in a way that um, they're not often uh, engaged in other ways. So uh, if there's music that they like, try that, try playing it, try, um, and if it's music that you're familiar with, talking about it. Um, or even, you know, a little bit of dancing, too, if that's part of their uh, um, their likes and their abilities. Um, explore ways to engage with virtual activities. So again, um, in lieu of having somebody come over, maybe you can do these activities in a virtual format. So maybe you can um, watch a music concert together uh, uh, virtually. You can visit, there's lots of now virtual activities like visiting national parks, visiting museums. You could play games like bingo. Um, so there's lots of ways to do activities virtually. You could even do some chair yoga. You know, you could do some um, physical things too. There's so many things out there now. Um, you can visit our, our website. To, we have a whole list of uh, virtual activities and options. Um, you know, really trying to make it social um, still by doing it together. You could cook together. You know, I know a lot of people are doing recipes online and get everything set up in the kitchen so that you can cook together, you know, setting up that little iPad uh, in the kitchen so that um, mom can see it and cook together with you. So, so we're really trying to seek out ways to stay engaged and connected. And, you know, we don't want to skip the holidays. We want to try new ways of doing these things so that we can still enjoy it. 
And then, um, so there's a whole set of other um, suggestions for holidays at facilities. So, so if someone is at a assisted living or memory care unit, um, there are ways to enjoy them and enjoy the holidays and visit. Again, you want to contact the staff. There's all kinds of each um, facility has their own set of COVID-19 safety protocols. So you want to, um, of course, get that information ahead of time, understand what the protocols are, um, what kind of visits are allowed, if any, are they virtual, um, you know, what time of day they are, you know, and, and then if the facility has celebrations of their own, uh, you, they usually do plan uh, a variety of events throughout the holidays. So try to join in in the celebrations and activities that they have going on. So you can enjoy it with the person um, that's there, either in person or virtually. Um, and then again, if you are going to visit plan, or even virtually plan activities, um, maybe you can send a gift and um, have them unwrap it while you're either there or there virtually. Again, looking at photo albums, um, doing virtual events as we talked about, about earlier, like um, visiting national parks or museums or music concerts, you know, trying to think about what you could do to be engaging and visit um, during this time. Uh, again, you want to plan for virtual visits with staff. Um, these facilities say the staff need to be involved in order to get the virtual platform set up um, and everything like that. So they need to provide that technical assistance. And so really plan that ahead of time with them, talking with them about what steps need to be taken to, um, to prepare for that. Okay, so travel. Now, again, we're in the time of COVID, so, you know, um, most travel is we're recommending against any kind of travel, any kind of air travel or traveling even outside of your city uh, during this time. Um, but if there is travel involved, you definitely want to check and read up about what you can do to be safe. Um, you know, there's all these airplane kits, you know, about what to do. They recommend not taking the mask off while on the plane, um, even for eating. Uh, you may want to have a straw for drinking so that you can limit any exposure. Um, but in general, um, really assess the person's limitations and abilities. You know, how long can they go sitting? How long can they go without um, um, getting anxious or agitated? You know, um, what are their limitations? Um, definitely never leave the person alone. You know, you may not think they're a wanderer, but with Alzheimer's or dementia, you never know um, when they can get confused or disoriented. Um, and if they're physically fine, it's usually in the early stages where you think, oh, you know, they're fine, they're not gonna wander off, but that means they're also physically capable of walking off um, without us knowing. So first of all, going anywhere outside of the house, make sure that they are never alone. You never leave them. Uh, one woman said she went to a restaurant and just left her husband outside on the bench while she went in and paid and he took off, you know? So thought that she had left already, went looking for her, you know, they had to walk down the road to find him. So you never know when the person may just get confused and start looking for you and end up wandering off. So that's a big cautionary um, uh, measure is to never leave them alone. Um, avoid peak travel times. You know, we know the airport, if you're going to go to the airport, it can be really crazy during the holidays. So trying to find times that are not going to be long lines. Try to stick to daily routines. We know routines are very, very helpful in, in keeping the person less confused. So if you can eat breakfast at the same time, go for a walk at the same time, eat lunch at the same time, you usually do. All those things help keep um, the person off feeling normal and regular, even during traveling. Um, going back to getting lost and wandering, um, try to have identification on the person, whether it's bracelets um, with name and phone numbers, clothing labels, tracking devices, there's all kinds of um, uh, uh, high tech, uh, low tech even, um, ways to identify the person and to track them. Um, we'll have another presentation sometime about LA Found, which provides a, a, a tracking bracelet for LA County. Um, um, there are lots of, uh, there's a place called the Alzheimer's Store, and you can go there, I think it's alzheimerstore.com. 
um, but it's a website where it has all kinds of devices for tracking. You know, there's lots of GPS tracking devices. It could be a little, could be a watch, a smart watch, you know, so trying to have all that set up. But again, understand the limitations of that too. Like if the battery dies, or if there's no reception, are you still able to track that person? Um, you know, our, the worst thing really that can happen is that person wanders off and gets lost and is not found again. So we want to, um, notify everybody around us, you know, let everybody know about that um, danger and risk and make sure that everybody's on board and keeping an eye out. So travel, yes, uh, right now monitor COVID-19 restrictions and recommendations. I think the recommendation right now, um, cases are still going up. So it is recommended to not um, go out of our home areas uh, for now, but um, there may be reasons why we do do it and, um, just be safe as safe as possible and read as much as you can about um, safety measures you can take when traveling. You know, again, it's the standard thing about wearing face masks, social distancing, um, hand sanitizer, disinfecting, not com touching common surfaces, um, and just being safe. Okay, those were our 10 tips. We come to, you know, our organization, as I mentioned, you know, any more information you'd like, um, you're welcome to call us. Um, we have a helpline, we have care consultants, we provide all kinds of talks and trainings and classes about Alzheimer's and caregiving and brain health. Um, we do have support groups, um, they're by webinar or telephone and they do help. Um, um, our staff knows a lot about um, the disease, but also those who are going through um, Alzheimer's or dementia, caring for somebody, they know a lot too. So those are great places to talk and discuss if you are going to travel, if you, our holidays are coming up and you're concerned, you can visit a support group and just kind of throw it out there. You know, what do people do to prepare? So um, there are great resources for understanding what to do. And then um, volunteering and fundraising, you know, that's also a positive thing to do. There's a lot going on. So um, there's lots of ways to volunteer. Um, we know there's a lot of places that um, seniors are home alone too. So there are opportunities to call seniors through, I know Meals on Wheels are organizing volunteer opportunities where you can call somebody who's home alone and, you know, just do those good things for people and, you know, lift our spirits up. And here's our helpline number. We also um, have a website and social media um, um, sites, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, <laughs> and all. So um, welcome to contact us. And again, like I said, we will provide the slides. So I'll hand it back to Jeanette and see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Tamiko. That was great information. I even had some questions and you answered them right away, especially when it came to having activities. I think that is probably the most challenging thing um, as a caregiver is what could be fun for them, but also safe, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, for those of you that are uh, tuning in or maybe just tuned in or tuned in a little um, after the uh, presentation started, um, feel free to add any of your questions. Um, even if it's something that maybe you missed and we, we covered, um, we're more than happy to, to answer anything. Um, also, along with this, uh, just kind of like refreshing everyone's memory, um, Kimiko did mention that uh, she was able to share the, um, the form of the tips with me, the, the worksheet, right? And so I have that. Um, if you're interested in um, having that worksheet, I'm going to be adding my email in the chat box. Uh, feel free to email me and let me know that you're interested in either the PowerPoint, if that's something you want to, to look at again, or um, if you want that worksheet that is um, very um, informative, uh, I would be more than happy to share that with you. Um, I will also be providing this um, on our RMC charity website. So along with the um, webinar that we're hosting today, um, I will have that up for replay, as a, maybe hopefully today, um, but if not today, then for sure at the beginning of next week. Um, and I will also add that worksheet there um, along with the PowerPoint. So you will have that all um, accessible um, early next week. Let's see, I have a question. Great. Um, so Donna would like to know, do you have suggestions for improving quality of virtual screen time 
with our loved one who is in a memory care home? Yes, so um, if they're in a memory care home, yeah, so it will be a combination of working with the staff to see how they're going to set up the virtual platform. Um, they do recommend, of course, if you can get the biggest screen as possible. So ideally, it's not through the phone, you know, I mean, through the phone is great for one on one. But if you're doing kind of a group thing, if there's any way that you can ask the staff to set up a, a computer screen or monitor or TV where um, they can have the virtual images there, um, you know, the bigger, the better. So that's one thing you can ask the staff. Um, definitely, like we said, you want to plan it well ahead of time so that the staff can work on any technical difficulties. You want to test it out ahead of time. You want to, you know, have everything prepared so that the time that you want to have that event, um, things go smoothly. We know we all know that that testing it out is important and making sure. And then. Um, you know, planning what activities you're going to do. The person with Alzheimer's or dementia on a memory care unit may not be able to engage as much verbally or may not be able to respond um, to a virtual event very well. So try to think of activities you can do. Like I say, maybe you can mail a photo album ahead of time um, that staff can help to look at or even just one picture at a time, maybe one or two um, printed photos, you know, like from Walmart or, you know, uh, just print out some photos and send them ahead of time with a card and look at them one at a time and just think of things that you can reminisce about. Um, like I say, the short term memory goes first, but the long term memories are usually still there. Um, what they say are like the overlearned behaviors, whether it's music, um, whether they played an instrument or played a sport or did gardening or cooking, you know, what are the things that they have done all their life that you can connect with and talk about and kind of um, generate some conversation because the conversation part may be difficult. Um, and again, also preparing yourself and others um, I've also heard that um, some families are hesitant to involve children because they say it may impact them negatively. But I would say, you know, children are much more resilient than we know and um, their ability to understand what's going on and their ability to empathize is there. So I don't know if we want to so much um, guard them from seeing somebody who's in memory care. We want them to still know their grandparent, to still know who that person was and try to think of ways where you can facilitate that. If there's ways to you know, there's going to be different family members of different ages. So how do you connect in different ways with each of that, uh, each of those family members with the person in the facility? Because, you know, this is the, these golden times that we have to connect with them. And so um, each, each day, each month is precious. So we want to try to um, value it and, and embrace it as much as possible. Yeah, um, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, she also shared with us, um, our visits are very short, less than five minutes. Hmm. It's been as limited. So. Yeah, so that's critical. So you want to, you know, plan as much as you can to, to help to make the best use of that time. Um, a second question that just came in. If the person is having a bad day and gets agitated or tearful, how can she be soothed? Yes, that's a great question. So yes, you know, it's great when everything's going great, you're looking at pictures and everything's fine, but something may happen. Um, maybe it's something we don't know. Maybe they are hungry or maybe they're dehydrated or maybe they didn't sleep well or maybe uh, their clothes are uncomfortable or, you know, we don't know what it is. It may may cause some disruption or frustration. So it's really uh, the goal overall, and this is the message to share with all family members, is whatever calms them down, whatever keeps them calm, uh, really trying to figure out what's not making them calm. Maybe it's too many questions. Maybe it's too much noise. Trying to eliminate those things that may um, cause confusion or frustration. And, and, you know, of course, the number one thing is not arguing with them. <laughs> you know, that's something that uh, we're always talking with family members. It's really hard um, because that's our father and that's our spouse that we're used to talking to. And, and uh, we have to really prepare ourselves and say, you know, we're just not going to argue whatever they say is right, always agreeing with them, 
Um, if they're accusing somebody of stealing their money, say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel bad that that happened. Let's find out what happened. You know, rather than saying no one stole your money, you're, you never had any money. And I don't know why you're saying that, you know, so really being careful of our tone and our way of approaching our, our, the whole thing is going to change. You know, we have to have everybody shift that way, you know, and say whatever we're going to agree with whatever they say, whatever they do, and try to help um, help relate to where they're at. And somebody else said in our groups, like really changing from trying to um, be in my spaces and really be in their space. Where are they at? What what are what is their ability in processing and and what are their feelings and emotion? You know, really connecting with if they're frustrated, you know, saying, I'm sorry, you're frustrated. Uh, you know, what is it we can do? You know, ask them, what's called, why are you upset? You know, rather than just telling you shouldn't be upset. You know, there's nothing going on. You know, ask them what's what's wrong? You know, what can we do? What do you need? You know, whatever it is, that's our goal is to keep them feeling confident, confident and comfortable and reassured that we're there to help them feel safe. Great. Um, and with that, I had a question actually. How can you prepare a non caregiver? So, someone that's not around uh, the person that has dementia, how do you prepare them uh, for that holiday um, event or um, a family gathering? Like, how do you let them know, hey, this is part of you know, what happens with someone with dementia, especially if they, they know, but they've never lived um, the experience of meeting someone with dementia. How do you prepare them for, for those meetings? Yeah, it's, it's very good to talk to them ahead of time. You know, I, I heard stories of, oh, you know, my nephews come over and they ask my husband all the time, you know, what, what's my name? Do you remember my name? You know, <laughs> so, you know, really kind of try and talk to them ahead of time. If you've seen these kind of behaviors that are disruptive, or this misunderstanding of what to do, um, you know, try to lay out some rules, even really write them down for yourself. Like these are the rules, don't ask too many questions, don't ask if they remembered something, um, make sure you're not too loud around them, you know, what are the limitations and, so, and, and hand that list of rules to them. Look, this is what uh, I want you, what I want you to do and what I want you to not do. You know, so no arguing with them, you know, trying to help them understand what is, um, what would make the visit smoother, you know, because like you said, they've never been around somebody with dementia, so they don't know what to do. The other thing, I, a big uh, recommendation I would have is to change their expectations. So they may come in expecting to have a conversation and, you know, um, be everything be normal and say, you look, we don't know. And also, we don't know what mood they're going to be in that day. <laughs> you know, we may plan a visit on December 24th and everything is great. I've tried to plan it at the right time, the right place, the right atmosphere, and they just didn't have a good night's sleep and they're in a crouchy mood, you know? So just prepare everybody. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, set, don't have any expectations. The goal is just for you to be here present and whatever, you know, is going on with the person, we're going to go with whatever they're in, you know, whether it's a bad mood or a good mood, or, you know, we're just going to enjoy whatever time we have uh, and try to make the best of it. So that's uh, one of the biggest recommendations is really have them not go in with any expectations, you know, like you're going to, maybe you, they said, oh, I'm going to come over, we're going to play bingo, we're going to listen to music, we planned all these great activities that they recommend, and that person doesn't want to do it, you know, that happens, <laughs> you know, so you want to encourage people to just take it easy, go with the flow, try some things, some things works and some things don't. And they one day it may work and another day it may not. So really being flexible, I would guess we would say in the end. Yeah, I know that's, that's great information. Um, I think aside from a caregiver preparing, you know, I think it's always great to, to prepare everyone around the person with dementia. Yeah. Right, and I want to add one more thing is that the other thing I've heard is people get really frustrated that the person didn't remember them, right, or they didn't remember, I just visited yesterday, and we came back today, he didn't remember, he said, oh, how come you never visit, and I was just here yesterday, you know, so that may be frustrating for people who aren't, don't understand, um, but I want to say that um, even if they don't remember you, the feeling is still there, you know, they may not be able to technically remember you but caregivers would tell you that they were in a great mood that day they felt good I felt good it just makes everybody a little happier so even if they don't technically remember your visit or your name they that energy and that feeling is there and that's what we want to focus on is that they 
uh, feel good. So don't get hung up on that. <laughs> yeah, I know that that's a great pointer to add. Yeah, because frustration is something that does come along with um, the unknown, you know. So yeah, definitely, I can see that happening. Um, any, I'm going to go ahead and double check that uh, chat box. If you have any questions that might have come up, feel free to add them in the chat box or in the Q&A. And we have another one in the Q&A. Okay, great. Um, if the person is diabetic and there is lots of desserts around and they insist on having it, how can I stop that? Uh, that's a tough one, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Um, yeah, it's hard if you're having um, family members over and um, we don't want to say you're not allowed to have desserts, you know. Um, but we do want to, people hopefully, I mean, it's tough because, like you say, you don't want there not to be a desserts. Again, those are family traditions and those are part of enjoying the holidays. But again, we want to focus on the health of the person. Um, and if possible, if they can be in another room or another place where it's not visible or accessible to the person with Alzheimer's or dementia, I mean, that's, um, we, we really want to think ahead and try to structure it that way because it can be very dangerous. You know, someone who's not complying with a diet, uh, a diet, you know, um, that's healthy for somebody with diabetes, it can be very dangerous. So you really want to try to stay, you know, in the diet that's recommended for them and have everybody on board. So again, this is all preparation to do now to really explain it to people. And they may say, oh, what's gonna be, what's harmful about a slice of pumpkin pie? You know, you know, let them do it for one day. And it may seem harmless, but if a person is diabetic, it can be very harmful. Um, so really, it's just a lack of information that other people have. If, you're, if you don't have diabetes, you don't really understand how harmful it can be on the system. Uh, so you really need to explain it. You need to prepare and say, again, it's really setting those boundaries and those rules. It's like, we would love to be over for the family gathering, but I really need to have the sweets in another room. I can't be around where uh, he can grab it or you can't even eat it in front of him, you know? So we really, and this is all for health, uh, health issues because, um, you know, um, not sticking to a diet that's healthy for somebody with diabetes um, is something that can really impact them. Um, you know, un, un, unregulated diabetes or high blood pressure, all the other, these other health issues um, can cause long-term impacts. Um, so we really want to prepare ahead of time and set those boundaries. Because again, it sounds like you're going to be very stressed. You know, maybe a, pump, slice, a small slice of pumpkin pie may not be that harmful, but if it's really stressing you out and really, you know, you know that the consequences may not be today, but tomorrow or the next week, you know, uh, you want to protect yourself. You want to set those guidelines and understanding with family members what the reasons why it stresses you out too. And then also checking in with your doctor on all these things, you know, the food requirements or, or guidelines, you know, maybe a slice, small slice of pumpkin pie is not bad. So just checking and seeing what is okay and what is not okay. And um, that way you'll get a, a good healthy guideline, um, you know, understanding what, what would be impactful and what would be allowed. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. It's always just being prepared, you know. And even if it was something, for example, for yourself, you know, like it's a taking maybe um, an alternate um, or alternative, um, I guess, maybe dessert for them too, you know, that could be very, very helpful um, in making that situation less stressful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you for answering that. Um, as we're going to go ahead and finish up, I want to thank everyone for, for joining us and for asking great questions. Um, I, I, I love when people are curious, especially when they share um, a personal experience, because sometimes that's really what it is. It's you're going through it yourself and you need a little bit of assistance and that's what we're here for. And that's what Kimiko is here for. Um, so again, I just want to remind everyone that um, if it's not up by to later today, um, it'll be up by next week. Um, I will have this recording up and ready to go for anyone that would like to uh, replay the, the webinar or just review a couple of the tips because you can never um, do too much reviewing, right? It's always going to be of help, um, especially during any, like, a, like Kimiko mentioned, either, you know, something for the holidays or just even uh, as simple as a family gathering. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone has those resources. 
Um, I did add my email in the chat box. So if a question does pop up, you know, later, later today and you want to know, feel free to email me. I'll go ahead and share that uh, message with Kimiko so she can go ahead and have that answered for you. Um, with that being said, um, Kimiko, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us and sharing this great information and great tips um, that are useful for everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank you for that. Um, is there anything else that you might want to add before we close out? Uh, I guess, you know, just try to enjoy it as best as you can. You know, we're all in this really difficult time and find small ways to enjoy it. And also take care of yourself if you're the caregiver. You know, find your little slice of pumpkin pie away if, if that's, you know, some small comfort to you. So remember that um, you do need to take care of yourself and find time for yourself and, and try to, you know, try different things. Not every, not every, you know, everything works for everyone, but all we can do is try and, and try to embrace the time, so. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you for that. That's, um, I would say the same, yeah. Alrighty, so I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you again um, at our next webinar. So um, thank you for joining us and thank you, uh, thank you all. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Kaniko.